Uh, my name's John Bell. I'm the director of the Centre for Public Law, and it's my pleasure to welcome you uh, on behalf of the law faculty to this uh, Sir David Williams lecture. The Sir David Williams lecture series was started in 2001 to celebrate the contribution to legal scholarship and to legal life of Sir David Williams. Sir David was an eminent public lawyer who specialised in the control of public power. He was one of the founders of modern administrative law, and he was also passionate about civil liberties. Um, his interest was not just in broad principles or slogans, but was involved in careful attention to the practical steps needed to secure real liberty in practice. From being Rouse Ball Professor and President of Wolfson College, Sir David moved to be the first full-time Vice-Chancellor of this university. And in his retirement, he was energetic in raising funds for the university, for law, and for the Squire Law Library. But he was equally energetic in his support and encouragement of younger scholars. We're very glad to have today Lady Sally Williams and her daughters uh, to celebrate his achievements. And we're also very grateful to John, Mr. John Nolan and Ms. Michael Russ, who have helped fund this lecture and who unfortunately cannot be with us this evening. It's very fitting that our speaker, Professor Jeremy Waldron, is delivering the lecture tonight. His passionate commitment to genuine liberal democracy is apparent from his work. Professor Waldron has written and published extensively in political theory and jurisprudence. He's written on general aspects of political liberalism in his works on the right to property, liberal rights, and God, Locke, and equality. But he's also had the courage to challenge practices in the United States which sully the standing of liberal democratic society. In particular, his essays in 2010 uh, are entitled Torture, Terror, and Trade-Offs, Philosophy for the White House. His interest in the proper conduct of liberal government fits with Sir David's attention to the detailed arrangements for governing society and his works on law and disagreement and dignity of legislation, a testimony to his careful attention of how legislators should conduct themselves. Professor Waldron is the Chichely Professor of Social and Political Theory and a Fellow of All Souls College. Um, for 2011 and 2012, he will hold this position um, in conjunction with a professorship at New York University. Um, but he's been in this post only for a very short while. Um, he was born in, and educated in New Zealand, and you will tell that from his accent. Um, uh, we won't say anything about the rugby, um, which may link him even more to Sir David Williams. Um, he was educated at the University of Otago and then studied for his doctorate um, under Professor Ronald Dworkin at the same time as I was doing, in the different, but in different faculties. He taught in, in Oxford at Lincoln College, where he was a fellow from 1980 to 1982, and then was a lecturer at the University of Edinburgh before moving to the United States in 1987 as Professor of Law in, and in the Jurisprudence and Social Policy Program in the School of Law at the University of California, Berkeley. He's therefore well known across the world as a champion of liberalism. His topic for tonight is how law protects dignity. A liberal society must treat the human person as valuable in their own right. Whether that person occupies a high social position or is homeless, whether that person is law-abiding or a suspected or proven terrorist. The topic is a challenge for modern societies across a wide range of fields, from police and military law to medical law and childcare. It's therefore my great pleasure to invite Professor Jeremy Waldron to give this year's Sir David Williams Lecture.
Thank you. It's a great honor uh, to be invited to give a lecture in this series celebrating the life and work of Sir David Williams. And it's a huge pleasure to be here in Cambridge, which I've visited. I mean, I've lived, I, I lived in the UK for a long, long time. And, and I was saying to uh, some colleagues earlier this afternoon, I think I've only ever spent about two weeks in Cambridge, but it's a, it's a huge pleasure to be here. It was a particular pleasure to get to meet Lady Williams at lunch today, and, and uh, I pass on my greetings to her. And um, I would like to thank uh, John Bell, not only for his kind introduction, but for making the arrangements for this. I, uh, it's uh, been a very easy task to uh, organize uh, the details of this occasion. So my topic is the way in which law protects dignity. The most obvious way is that law protects dignity by proclaiming and enforcing specific norms that prohibit attacks on it. So some of these norms, I've mentioned one of them on the, on the, the song sheet that you have, that you have here, uh, the common article three of the Geneva Conventions prohibits, among other things, outrages upon human dignity. And that's very clear to us because it uses the word. But other provisions uh, of uh, international law and human rights law protect dignity even when they use slightly different words, like the prohibition on degrading treatment and punishment, plainly, that is intended to protect dignity. We could easily spend a session like this, and I would love to, debating and discussing what degrading treatment has come to mean, for example, in Article 3 of the European Convention and in the jurisprudence associated with that. But in my lecture today, I want to do something different and talk about some less obvious ways in which law protects dignity, but ways which are deeper, more pervasive, and more intimately connected with the very nature of law itself. Because when you look at common Article 3 of the Geneva Conventions, or Article 3 of the European Convention on Human Rights, it may strike you as a matter of historical contingency that dignity is protected under these provisions. Sure, we could argue politically that any worthwhile bill or charter of human rights ought to protect dignity as an uh, important value. But it's notorious that at the level of positive law, many bills of rights omit things that ought to have been included and include things that ought to have been omitted. There is no mention of dignity, for example, in the United States Constitution. And to the extent that the ideal has had any influence at all in American constitutional law, it's had to be, uh, for example, in Eighth Amendment jurisprudence, it has had to be imported as judge-made doctrine. And that, too, is historically contingent, not to say vulnerable, as Justice Thomas would say, to passing fads and fashions. Some people have suggested not only that dignity ought to be protected as a human right, but that dignity is itself the ground of rights, it's the premise of rights, it's the basis from which all our human rights flow. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and I've quoted uh, a piece from the preamble there under heading two, the preamble begins with the acknowledgement that the rights contained in the covenant derive from the inherent dignity of the human person. And that's a common theme in philosophical discussions, too, particularly recent philosophical discussions of human rights. So even if this is not a connection between dignity and law as such, it's a connection between dignity and a whole area of law, namely the area of human rights law. Some people have remarked that, maybe in a more skeptical spirit, that dignity is just a word we use, and use relatively indiscriminately, whenever we are engaging in human rights talk. So it's no accident that it turns up all over the area in the content of the provisions, in the preamble to the provisions, in a lot of the jurisprudence associated with the provisions, and in judicial declarations of various sorts. In a, in a very influential paper published in 2008, my Oxford colleague Christopher McCrudden remarked that dignity, the word dignity, operates mainly as a placeholder 
for the absence of agreement in human rights discourse, so that in this preamble it's evident that the framers of the International Covenant wanted to say something very, very solemn and serious about human rights. But they couldn't agree exactly what it was that they wanted to say, but dignity works perfectly well. It sort of can mean all things to all men and uh, can therefore occu uh, occupy this role as a placeholder. Maybe that's overly pessimistic, but it does alert us to the fact that dignity may not necessarily be a load-bearing idea. I think it is, but I am conscious of this alternative possibility. A term that is pervasive is always in danger of platitudinousness, is always in danger of becoming a platitude. And if we are tracing the pervasiveness of dignity, we must take care that we are not just on the trail of some meaningless, embedded, rhetorical bombast. So we need to just bear that in mind as a sort of alternative possibility. So everybody needs definitions. What do I mean by dignity? What is it that we are supposed to be tracking in its relation to law? It's notoriously difficult to define, but I've taken a stab at it under heading three on the sheet there. Um, dignity, in my view, is a sort of status concept. It has to do with the standing, perhaps the formal legal standing, or perhaps more informally, or and perhaps more informally, the moral standing, the moral presence that a person may have in a society or in his or her dealings with others or in his or her dealings with the state. So what I mean by the term when I ask about the various ways in which law protects, recognizes, vindicates, promotes human dignity is something like this. Dignity is the status of a person. That means that she, I'm going to use a feminine pronoun, but obviously it's supposed to apply to men as well. <laughs> Dignity is the status of a person that means that she is recognized as having the ability to control and regulate her actions in accordance with her own apprehension of norms and reasons that apply to her. It means that she is capable of giving and entitled to give an account of herself and of the way in which she is regulating her actions and organizing her life, an account that others are bound to pay attention to. And it's a status that means that she may reasonably demand that her agency and her presence among us as a human being must be taken seriously and must be accommodated in the lives of others and other people's attitudes and actions towards her and in social and political life generally. Now, it's a rough definition, and I don't want too much to hang on it. And I imagine that if one were writing a treatise on dignity, one would want to add volumes to that definition. I'm not sure that one would want to take anything away from it, and that's basically what I want to, to emphasize here. I can adduce no canonical provenance for this definition, but it's not simply a stipulation in the way that Humpty Dumpty stipulated a meaning for glory. I believe that the definition I've given captures much that is already present in our ordinary usage of dignity. But just before we go on into the main line of our inquiry, let me remind you of one way at least in which it's controversial. I'm using dignity as a status idea rather than as a value idea. Right? It was used as a value idea by Immanuel Kant in the groundwork of the metaphysics of morals where it appeared to refer to a certain kind of value beyond price. A, a, a something might have... Uh, uh, value, in which case we could trade it for something of equivalent value. But certain things, he said, have dignity, which meant that they couldn't be traded for anything of any price. They were non-fungible with other values, and they were, in, in a sense, infinitely precious. And I think that's a very important idea, but I'm not really sure that that's what we want to convey with dignity. I think, I mean, even in ordinary language, dignity has a connection with bearing, the way you hold yourself, the way you present yourself to others. Yeah? We talk about uh, main, uh, allowing people to present a dignified presence to other people, and much of the work that we do, for example, with regard to degrading treatment has to do with various ways in which the law might interfere with that. 
So I want to distinguish myself, nothing much hangs on this, but I want to distinguish myself from the sort of enterprise that I would be undertaking if I were working in the Kantian tradition. Twelve years after the publication of the groundwork, Kant wrote again about dignity in the doctrine of virtue, which is the second part of his late work, The Metaphysics of Morals. Everything seems to have metaphysics in its title with Kant, but this is not the groundwork of the metaphysics of morals, but the metaphysics of morals. And there he spoke of dignity much more in terms of status. He talked of the respect that a person can exact as a human being from every other person, and that respect is no longer simply the quivering awe excited in a person by his own moral capacities, which is what you find in the groundwork and in the second critique, for example, but a genuine making room for another on the basis of sure-footed equality and an acting towards other people as though he or she too were one of the ultimate ends to be taken into account. That's more a sort of status spin on the Kantian idea, and I'm more comfortable with that. My definition doesn't directly capture all the work that dignity does in law. I mentioned rules against degrading treatment and outrages upon personal dignity in the Geneva Conventions. And those are sometimes used, as I said, to vindicate elementary aspects of adult self-presentation, care of self, taking care of elementary physical needs, and so on, and to protect against forms of humiliation impinging on this interest. So a person's dignity is affronted when they are left lying naked in their own urine, for example, in a cell at Guantanamo Bay, or when torture or other maltreatment induces a sort of regression into an infantile state. People have lost control of the most elemental provisions of their own self-presentation. And I think this is a connected idea, cognate with my definition via this notion of being recognized and treated as a being capable of self-control, as a being capable of conforming action to norms and, and being able to present a genuine adult presence in society. And so too we might consider the doctrine in European Convention jurisprudence which holds that it is degrading to parade criminals or suspects in shackles, chains, in the way that we routinely do in the United States. It's degrading to parade criminals or suspects in shackles unless they, pl they pose a clear and immediate danger to themselves or others. Again, this requirement is connected to the idea that we must treat people in principle unless there is compelling evidence to the contrary that they are capable of self-control. People are not to be treated leashed held back like wild animals, but are to be allowed to present themselves in public, even in the most fraught circumstances. This, we shall see, is very important towards the end of what I'm going to say today when I want to talk in section 10 on the topic of dignified coercion, which might strike you as an oxymoron, but I'm going to try to argue that it's something we should take very seriously. There are many aspects of the proper treatment of people that have little or nothing to do with dignity on my account. I believe that our basic duty to respect and sustain human life, duty to refrain from killing, for example, important though it is, is not really connected with dignity. I, th I think little or nothing is gained by adding to the preciousness or sacredness of human life some sort of dignitarian um, idea. I know that in the Roman Catholic literature, in natural law jurisprudence, and in some bioethics literature, human dignity is used just in the sense of the special worth or sacredness of human life. And so people talk about the, the dignity of embryos, or they talk about the dignity of stem cells, or they talk about the dignity of human life in relation to practices like um, abortion and so on. In my view, the problem with this account is not the political implications that it has. The problem with this account is not the theological background that it evokes. The problem is that it appropriates the term dignity to do work that worth or sacred worth might do just as well and distracts us from these other aspects of presence and presentation that seem to me to be um, uh, done and importantly done under the auspices of the way the phrase is used. Now look again at the definition I've given. When you read it, I hope the sense in which law inherently promotes dignity may begin to become apparent. And I have to acknowledge that I tailored this definition for the purposes of the lecture. So we talk about um, 
We talk about a person capable of giving and entitled to give an account of herself, and I want that to convey an image of something like a litigant or a defendant who is not just hauled before the court and subject to a determination, but is given a moment to speak, to adduce evidence, to make arguments on his or her behalf. That's the sort of idea that I want to pursue in this, in this, in this lecture. Dignity, I think, although it is a pervasive idea and goes beyond the law, it hooks up in obvious ways with juridical ideas about hearings and due process and status to sue. And the basic aim of what I'm going to say here this evening is to elaborate those connections and make them explicit. Here's a preliminary foray. At the beginning of the lecture, I considered the idea of a specific right to dignity. Then a few minutes later, I considered the idea commonly expressed in the preambles of major human rights instruments that dignity might be the ground of every human right. A third possible connection is that the very form and structure of a right, the very idea of having a right, being the holder of a right, uh, conveys an idea of the right bearer's dignity. This will be familiar to some of the philosophers and jurisprudes in the room and explicitly so in what is known as the choice theory of rights, once advanced by Professor H.L.A. Hart. Hart believed that having a legal or a moral right was not just a matter of being the object of legal or moral concern. He rejected what is sometimes known as the benefit or the interest theory of rights. He favored instead the description of the right bearer as having a power to determine what another person's duty should be or having the power to determine what another person should have to do about the duty that they owed to him. So as he said, the right bearer is morally in a position and often legally in a position to determine by his choice how the duty bearer shall act. The right bearer can choose to sue or not to sue. The right bearer can choose to waive the right or enforce the right. The right bearer has a certain sort of little local sovereignty over another person's over another person's um, moral or legal position. Hart developed this argument first for natural rights, but he thought at least for a while that it was true of legal rights, although he began to tiptoe away from this position uh, in the 1980s. Something similar can be found in the American philosopher Joel Feinberg's account of rights as claims. To have a right in law is to possess the dignity of a recognized claimant so that when you make a claim for a certain form of treatment or a claim to a certain amount of good, people don't just simply say, well, what is that to us? Why should we take any notice of this? A recognized claimant is the one who can insist that a claim be heard and responded to. So to the extent that rights are pervasive in law, the recognition and respect that claimants are entitled to as such is going to be a pervasive aspect of law's commitment to dignity. That is, we insist on the dignity of somebody who is able to stand up unapologetically for their own interests and to a certain extent control, use their own free will to control what society and what other people have to do about those interests. It's sometimes said that we can imagine law without rights. I think that's false. Even if Hart is wrong about rights generally, I think any legal system will characteristically and not just contingently establish and respect individual positions that have the features that Hart's theory or Feinberg's theory attribute to rights. For example, law will recognize potential plaintiffs and defer to their dignity, their standing, in allowing them to make decisions about whether some norm violator is to be taken to task or not. It's even more evidently false if um, my colleague Ronald Dworkin is right in the basic rights thesis that he set out years ago in his book, Taking Rights Seriously. Yeah. Amidst the plethora of other propositions, Dworkin argued that when you go to law, when you come in as a plaintiff and make some claim or as a petitioner, you, you don't just enter the courtroom in a lobbying mode. You don't just try to convince the court that it would be a rather good idea for you to have this money paid for you or this remedy given to you. You walk in in the mode of somebody with an entitlement, and it may not mean that you're entitled to bang the desk, but you are demanding something for which you have a right. You are holding your head high and insisting that your presence 
and your claims must be taken seriously and, if need be, peremptorily in the determination of what others are uh, to do. So in those ways, the very being of the, the very nature of litigation, the very sense in which people inaugurate and pursue claims at law, pays some sort of tribute to the way their dignity is recognized. These are people, the law doesn't often work, certainly private law doesn't work on its own motion. It is put in motion by plaintiffs who um, have the power and the authority to pursue, pursue things in this way. Of course, their claims may be false or controversial, but the controversy is a controversy about entitlement, not just a controversy about what it would be a rather good idea to do. So the, <coughs> there is all of that. But I want to go even more deeply and more closely to the concept of law than this. So in section 5, which as you see is entitled Fuller and Raz, Guiding Action and the Dignity of Self-Application. Famously, in a book based on his 1963 Storrs lectures, The Morality of Law, the American jurist Lon Fuller developed an account of what he called the inner morality of law. The inner morality of law insisted that laws must be phrased in general terms, they must be clear, they must be reasonably stable, they must be prospective, and they must actually determine what officials do. And he said that these principles, the observance of these principles is bound up with the basics of legal craftsmanship. Now, there's going to be some internal gossip here, which those of you who are uninterested in controversies and jurisprudence can take a little nap but those, like my friend Professor Kramer over there, who are interested in these matters may want to be alert to. Positivist legal philosophers, beginning with H.L.A. Hart, have sometimes expressed bewilderment as to why Fuller called these internal principles of prospectivity and generality, clarity, and so on. Why did he call them a morality? I think this bewilderment is disingenuous, and I said so in an article about Hart, published in the New York University Law Review in 2008. Fuller called these internal principles a morality because he thought they had inherent moral significance. It's not only that he believed that observing them made it more difficult to do injustice, something that Professor Kramer has contested. Not only that, but that he did believe. It was also because he thought observing these principles of generality, prospectivity, clarity, and so on, was a way of respecting human dignity. He said this, to embark on the enterprise of subjecting human conduct to rules involves of necessity a commitment to the view that man is or man can become a responsible agent capable of understanding rules and following them and answerable for his defaults. When you communicate a rule, when you, you've tried to communicate a rule to a dog, you can't, you can't do it, you can communicate a rule to a human being you are treating that human being as having a certain agency, a certain ability to understand things and control action accordingly. And he went on, every departure, every departure from the principles of law's internal morality is an affront to man's dignity as a responsible agent. To judge his actions by unpublished laws or retrospective laws or to order him to do actions that are impossible is to convey to him your indifference to his powers of self-determination that are so important to dignity. Now, these are not just platitudes. Fuller is referring here to a very specific aspect of law, in my view, widely neglected in jurisprudence, which is law's general reliance on what American legal philosophers have called self-application. That is, laws are addressed to people, and the primary application of the laws is by the ordinary people themselves to, which, to whom the law is addressed. Self-application, extraordinary, extraordinarily important feature of the way in which legal systems operate. They work by using rather than short-circuiting. They work by using rather than short-circuiting the agency of ordinary individuals. 
They count on people's capacities for practical understanding. They count on the fact that they are communicating rules to beings capable of self-control, beings capable of memory, beings capable of internalizing rules, beings capable of self-monitoring, which is monitoring how their behavior is at a given moment in relation to given circumstances, and beings capable of the moderation and modulation of their behavior in response to their self-monitoring and their understanding of the rule. From traffic laws to tax laws, from property to criminal law, self-application is absolutely crucial. We don't have anything remotely like the power that would be required for the forceful application of laws to people. The law relies on self-application, and laws are primarily communicated to people on the basis that they will engage in self-application. I don't mean that you can do whatever you like with the rules that are given to you. There are checks, there are police, there are tax auditors, there are plaintiffs who will respond if they think you are not self-applying the laws in the appropriate way, and disputes will break out about this. But by and large, at every moment in your driving, in whatever dates are laid down for the return of your income tax returns, in almost every aspect of criminal law and almost every aspect of private law, we rely on self-application. Not only that, but in constitutional law, we rely on self-application, only self-application now of the officials to whom the laws are addressed. Even when the self-application of general norms is not possible and institutional determinations are necessary, either because of disputes about application or because application inherently requires an official determination. So, uh, laws about divorce cannot be self-applied. I can't, as it were, do anything to make myself di divorced. I have to await an official <coughs> determination. And when there are conflicts, sometimes we have to have official determinations. Even when the, when the application of laws is done by an official body, still the particular orders that are issued look towards self-application in their turn. Unsuccessful defendants in private law litigation are expected themselves voluntarily to pay the damages that have been decreed. Rare is the case where the bailiffs have to actually turn up and take the property from them. I don't mean to deny the ultimately coercive character of law. As I said, I'm going to come back to that under Section 10, say much more about that. But even in criminal cases where the coercive element is front and center, it is often the case that we rely on individuals to anticipate in their own actions the coercion that is being applied to them. Take him down and the criminal turns around and goes with his waters. He doesn't usually have to be dragged. You will be taken to a place of execution, they say, in the United States, but usually people walk to their execution. Um, in the United States, I'm not sure whether this is true in England, um, where somebody is sentenced to a imprisonment, say in federal prison, often a date is set for them to turn up at the prison gates to begin their sentence. Occasionally people go AWOL and have to be tracked down and seized and dragged, kicking and screaming to prison. But the vast majority of convicted defendants simply turn up at the appropriate date and, and, and uh, present themselves at the prison gates. The law strains as far as possible to look for ways of enabling voluntary application of its general norms and voluntary application of its specific decrees. All of this makes ruling by law and enforcing law quite different from, say, herding cows with a cattle prod or directing a flock of sheep with a dog. It's quite different, too, from eliciting a reflex recoil with a scream of command. This pervasive emphasis on self-application is, in my view, uh, definitive of law differentiating it sharply from systems of government that work primarily by either manipulation or terrorism or galvanizing behavior in various ways. And as Fuller recognizes, all of this represents a decisive commitment by law to the dignity of human individual and imposes a discipline in the way that law works because you can't work through self-application unless that norms are properly communicated in a form that can be self-applied. There's something of this recognition, too, in my former mentor Joseph Raz's famous article from 1977 on the rule of law, where he connects the rule of law to law's action-guiding character, which is essentially the same notion, 
and relates that in turn to the idea of dignity. He says, observance of the rule of law is necessary if the law is to respect human dignity. Respecting human dignity entails treating humans as persons capable of planning their future. Now, I should add that Raz now repudiates any interest in dignity. When I cited this in a paper that was circulated to him recently, he sent me an email that said, Hi, Jeremy, good to hear from you. On page one of your circulated paper, you imply that I said something about dignity without criticizing the notion. If I did, I have to repent, but I still hope that I did not. And when I reminded him that indeed he had, in fact, he had said an awful lot about dignity without criticizing the notion, he replied, Terrible. I repent. <laughs> so we can put Raz in the category of those who think the talk of dignity is now a rhetorical bombast. But just as we referred to Hart's choice theory of rights, even though he repudiated that in the 1980s, so we can refer to Raz's theory about the connection between the rule of law and dignity, even though he's now grumpy and impatient with the, with the concept. I'm going to omit what I have under 5A, but I do want to mention the point under 5b. It is tempting to say that law can guide conduct only if it is determinate. That is, only if it takes the form of rigid rules, like speed limits, or limits on tax deductions, or things like that. But it's remarkable, of course, that law doesn't always or even often present itself in terms of rules. It often presents itself in terms of standards, using terms like reasonable. You must take reasonable care in tort law. Or you must drive at a reasonable speed or pay reasonable attention to road conditions when you're driving. And we communicate those standards to people. They're standards rather than rules because they use open-ended evaluative terms that require not just perception but judgment on behalf of the person. And it's tempting, and a lot of my colleagues in the business foster this temptation, to say that these norms, phrased in that way, are hopeless until some judge pins down the meaning of reasonableness for us in particular circumstances. I don't believe that. I believe what the law does is communicate these standards to us mindful of the fact that we have the ability to engage in complex evaluative thinking and we can put that ability to work in the self-application of the law. Again, there may be a problem if there are cultural reasons why, for example, my estimate of reasonable speed will be different from a police officer's estimate of reasonable speed. And some cases like this have arisen in the American West. But for the most part, um, people seem to be able to cope with these standards and to administer them judiciously. And again, I think this is another aspect of human dignity. The law credits us with the intelligence and the thoughtfulness to be able to apply these standards. It doesn't just insist that the only forms of self-application that we can participate in are the self-application of mechanically phrased rules. An important additional way in which law respects the dignity of those who are governed is in the provision that it makes for trials or hearings in cases where an official determination is necessary. And I want to talk a little bit now about procedure. A legal system is not just a set of general norms officially recognized and applied to individual cases. We call a mode of government law on account not only of the existence of rules, but on account of the distinctive way in which official applications are conducted. Law is applied by courts, not just by bureaucrats. By which, by courts, I mean institutions certainly devoted to settling disputes about the applications of norms. But I also mean institutions that do that through the medium of hearings, formal events, tightly structured procedurally, in order to enable an impartial tribunal to determine the rights and responsibilities of particular people fairly and effectively after hearing evidence and argument from both sides. Yeah? It's a hearing, it's not just a determination, in which case the tribunal listens. The tribunal doesn't just speak. And that listening aspect is a huge tribute to the dignity of the people that law is dealing with. It is remarkable, this is another bit of jurisprudential gossip, 
It is remarkable how little there is about courts in the conceptual accounts of law presented in modern positivist jurisprudence. In his book, famous book, The Concept of Law, H.L.A. Hart tells us that, well, a legal system is a union of primary and secondary rules, primary rules of conduct, secondary rules of change, secondary rules of recognition, and secondary rules of application. And that's about as close as he gets to the idea of courts. He says, secondary rules of adjudication empower certain individuals to make authoritative determinations of the question of whether on a particular occasion a primary rule has been broken. But his account defines the relevant institutions simply in terms of their output function. They take a dispute and they resolve it. In the way that a king might resolve a dispute among two peasants. The making of authoritative determinations of whether a primary rule has been broken. There's nothing on the distinctive processes by which this function is performed. For all that Hart says, a star chamber proceeding ex parte without any sort of hearing would satisfy the definition. So would the tribunals that we call in the Antipodes kangaroo courts. So for that matter would a minister of police rubber stamping a secret decision to have somebody executed for violating a secret command. Yeah? All of these would satisfy Hart's definition of adjudication. Outside the hallowed halls of academic positivism, I suspect most ordinary people, and I suspect most people in this room, would regard hearings and due process as essential rather than contingent elements of the institutional arrangements we call legal systems. One of the most distinctive things, not just that legal systems involve the presence and communication of general rules, but legal systems involve hearings and processes, rigidly controlled proceedings by which determinations are made. Maybe we don't want to be too essentialist about details. In general jurisprudence, which is a study of law as such, our concept of a court and a hearing is necessarily rather abstract, and there are many different differences between proceedings that are used in, I don't know, um, British in, in the English legal system and the proceedings that are used in the French legal system and the proceedings that are used in the Chinese legal system and so on. Still, the concept of a court is essential, and it's not just the concept of a law enforcement agency. It would be quite wrong, even in general jurisprudence, even in the most general jurisprudence, to abstract away from the elements of process presentation, formality, impartiality, evidence, and argument. The basic idea, as I said, is procedural. The operation of a court involves a way of proceeding which offers to those who are immediately concerned an opportunity to make submissions and present evidence in an orderly form. The mode of presentation may vary, the order of presentation may vary, but the existence of such an opportunity does not. And once presented, the evidence is then made available to be examined and scrutinized and confronted by the other party. And in the course of all of this, both sides are not only treated respectfully, but above all are listened to by the tribunal, which is bound in some manner to attend to the evidence presented and to respond to the submissions that are made in the reasons that it eventually gives for its decision. These are abstract characteristics, but they're not arbitrary abstractions. They capture a very deep and important sense associated, I believe, foundationally with the idea of a legal system that law is a mode of governing people that acknowledges those people have a view of their own to present. They people have a perspective of their own which they want to publicly put forward concerning their conduct and concerning the application of some norm to their conduct and situation. In other words, law proceeds on the basis that applying a norm to an individual is not like deciding what to do about a rabid animal or like deciding what to do about a dilapidated and deserted house, yeah, which elicits an, uh, an official determination, but we don't, as it were, listen to the house's point of view or the rabid dog's point of view. But when we deal with people, we insist on recognizing the dignity of a being that has a perspective of its own to present. As such, that embodies what I think of as a crucial dignitarian idea, and it's back there in the definition, respecting the dignity of those to whom norms are applied as beings capable of explaining themselves. As beings capable of explaining themselves and whose explanations are not for purely private consumption. 
Indeed, and this is another point along the same lines, it's not just a matter of audi alterum partum. I think it's part of our concept of law that legal positions are sustained or defeated as a matter of argument. And by that I, do, I don't just mean an abstract series of propositions, I mean the activity of argumentation. Argument by counsel for each side, and responsive argument rather than just peremptory decision at the level of the tribunal making its determination. This, I believe, contributes yet another strand to law's respect for human dignity. Law presents itself to its subjects as something you can make sense of. Not just one damned thing after another. You know, it's the first command and the second command. There's the millionth command and the millionth and first command. But that you can make sense not just of each command, as you might do with some doctrine of legislative purpose, but you can make sense of the big picture. And that people are capable, along with their legal representatives, of conceiving an account of how their relation to the particular norm that is at issue in the case can be presented if you screw your eyes up in a certain way and argue for 10 or 30 or 50 minutes, can be presented in light of a particular conception, maybe an idiosyncratic conception, but again, one for public consumption, about how their, their, the sense that they make of the law fits with the sense that they make of their position. In this way, too, then, law pays attention and pays respect to the people who live under it conceiving them as the bearers of reason and intelligence. Conceiving of them as the bearers of reason and intelligence. The individuals whose lives law governs are treated by it as thinkers who can grasp and grapple with the rationale of their governance and relate it in complex but intelligible ways to their own view of a relation between their actions and the actions and purposes of the state. So those are a couple of procedural ways in which it seems to me that, in its essence, law respects people as dignified beings capable of presenting and explaining themselves. Let's try a different tack. In an article published in 2007 and in my 2009 Tanner Lectures at Berkeley, I argued that we should pay attention to the ancient connection between dignity and rank. Between dignity and rank. In Roman usage, dignitas embodied the idea of the honor, the privileges, the powers, and the deference due to rank or office. So somebody might have the dignity of Pontifex Maximus, or the dignity of a general. And their dignity might be a combination of the office and of their particular flair in exercising it. And in English, this too was the original meaning of the word dignity, as in the 1399 statute that took the crown away from Richard II and said, Ye renounced and ceased of the state of king and of the lordship and of all the dignity and worship that belonged thereto. You are renouncing all the dignity of the crown. Some have suggested that this old connection between dignity and rank, dignity and hierarchy, was superseded by the Jewish Christian notion of the dignity of humanity as such human dignity. I'm not convinced by that. I think it's a more complicated story. As I argued in that article, I think what happened was a generalization of high rank. I think we generalized high rank. We decided to make every man a duke, every woman a countess. We didn't just replace the ranking idea with a egalitarian idea. We leveled up rather than abandoning a hierarchical notion and replacing it with an egalitarian one. The idea is that the modern notion of human dignity doesn't cut loose from the idea of rank. Instead, it involves an upward equalization so that we now accord to every human being something of the dignity, rank, and expectation that was formerly accorded, say, to nobility, or to professors, or to judges, or, or, or patriarchs, or whatever. I got this idea from Gregory Vlastos, who was a distinguished classic scholar, at Berkeley when I was there in the 1990s. And James Whitman of the Yale Law School has also pursued this in his work in the idea of an extension of formerly high status treatment to all sectors of the population. You see, you can imagine, you don't have to imagine, you can just do the history, a system of government that involved radical discrimination at law among different sorts of rank. 
High-ranking persons would be regarded as capable of participating fully in something like a legal system. They would be trusted with a voluntary self-application of norms. Their word and testimony would be taken seriously. They would be entitled to the benefit of elaborate processes and so on. If they were coerced, they would be dealt with under the auspices of quite respectful modes of coercion, quite different from and much less brutal than those applying to other the members of other strata in society. At the other extreme, there might be a caste or a class of persons who were dealt with purely coercively by the authorities. There'd be no question of listening to or trusting anything they said. They would be a pair in shackles if they appeared at a hearing at all. Their evidence, if they gave evidence, would be taken under torture, and they would not be entitled to make decisions or arguments relating to their own defence, nor to have their statements heard or taken seriously. They would not have the privilege of bringing suit in the courts, or if they did, it would have to be under somebody else's protection. They would not be, as we say, sui juris. Ancient slave societies were like that. Modern slave societies are a little bit like that. And many other societies in the past with which we are uncomfortably familiar evolved similar discriminating forms that distinguished between, if you like, the legal dignity of a noble, the legal dignity of a common man, the legal dignity of a woman, and the legal dignity of a slave, a serf, or a villain. I think it is part and an essential part of our modern notion of law that all such gross status differences have been abandoned. It's not that the idea of status goes out the window. We keep the idea of status for conditions that people might be in from time to time, like bankruptcy or infancy or being a part of the military or something like that. But gross status differences between different types of human beings we no longer work with. In 1606, in London, a carriage carrying Isabel, the Countess of Rutland, was attacked by sergeants at Mace, pursuant to a writ alleging a debt of $1,000. The English reports tell us that the said sergeants in Cheapside, with many others, came to the Countess in her coach, showed her their mace, and touching her body with it, said to her, we arrest you, madam, at the suit of the creditor. And thereupon they compelled the coachman to carry the said countess to the Comte in Wood Street, where she remained seven or eight days imprisoned until she paid the debt. The countess, as you would imagine, was terribly affronted by these proceedings, and she sued successfully, and the court held that the arrest of a countess by a sergeant at Mace is against all law, and a severe sentence was given against the sergeants and others, their confederates. The court quoted an ancient maxim to the effect that law will have a difference between a lord, of la a lord or lady and a common person. And it held that the person of someone who is a, a peer is not to be arrested in such cases for two reasons. One, because of her dignity. And secondly, because it's presumed that being a peer, she has the ability to pay her debts uh, anyway. And that was 1606. And now we apply at least the first point to all debtors. Yeah? No debtors are seized in this way. No debtors are imprisoned in this way. No one's body is allowed to be seized by their creditors. And we do that on account of an equalization up of the dignity in this place. In this and in a great number of other respects, we have evolved a more or less universal status, a more or less universal legal dignity that entitles everyone to something like the treatment at law that was previously confined to high-status individuals. Now, um, the sense in which we all have equal access to law is obviously a little bit fictitious. You know that law continues to discriminate in various ways between the rich and the poor. One thing to bear in mind when we talk about dignity in these matters is to remember that legal dignity at least, whatever you think about moral dignity, Legal dignity is a construction. It's a ramshackle human construction, like a building site. It's incomplete. It's a work in progress. Bits of it occasionally fall down and have to be built up again. But it's a construction that we have made for ourselves, perhaps in order to respond to what we think of as the inherent dignity of human beings, but legal dignity, at any rate, in all these respects, is something that we have tried to build and it is something that we have built in the first instance as a set of ideals, not just moral ideals, but ideals for our legal system that we, that we respond to. 
And I do want you to bear this in mind when I come to talk about my final topic, which is something about dignified coercion. Law is an exercise of power, and that power operates, in the last resort, coercively upon people. And a number of thinkers, including my hero, Lon Fuller, have sometimes said that we have to distinguish between law in its dignitarian capacity and law in its coercive capacity. I think that's wrong. I think that's wrong. I think there are modes of coercion and modes of coercion, and some of them are dignified and some of them are not dignified. So I've listed there on the, the song sheet four ways in which law operates coercively. It presents its norms as categorical and non-negotiable demands. It's committed to doing whatever it takes to see that the orders are obeyed. It imposes punishments. And it exercises the power to get people to do things against their will and to tightly controls people's behavior. I don't have time to go through all of these in detail. The earlier remarks about self-application, it seems to me, are tremendously important. As far as possible, when law coerces us, it seeks to do so by communicating what it wants of us and asking, it to, asking us to do that ourselves. People in the room will disagree as to whether, for example, the death penalty is an affront to human dignity. Many people in Europe believe it is. Many people in the United States believe it is not. But the way it is administered is that as far as possible, even though the death sentence will be carried out whatever the convict wishes, as far as possible, the, conduct, the convict will be treated as a human agent up until the last moment when he is extinguished. Not exactly that we expect him to voluntarily administer the hemlock in the way that Socrates, Socrates did, but we expect people to walk to their execution. We expect them to participate in the procedures of the last days of their execution. And that, if that's true of the most extreme penalties that law can impose, it's certainly true, as I said, of many of the others. We strain and try to go as far as we can by indicating the demands that no doubt we are to use force to get them if we can, if we have to. But if possible, we attempt to get voluntary, maybe it's the wrong word, but agency involved in the picture. And there are some forms of force that we eschew, or at least I always thought up until 2003 that we eschew. There are some things, if they can only be done by torture, we don't do them. Because law has decided that whatever modes of coercion it uses, it will not smash people's agency and break their agency and regress them to the status of infants. Now, what happened in the United States between 2002 and 2008 shook a lot of people's faith in that. I believe it undermined the legality of our legal system. I've argued extensively, extensively on that. But I think it's, it's tremendously important to understand the ways in which law operates as far as possible, non-brutally, even when it operates coercively. And you, say, you find the same thing in doctrines of punishment, that punishments must not be inhuman. What does that mean? It means partly that they must not be cruel, but they must be punishments of the sort that humans are capable of bearing, with their heads held high, if necessary. And these notions, which are tremendously difficult to state, of ways in which law seeks to treat us as responsible, dignified agencies, even when we are most at the mercy of its power and authority, are, I think, hugely important in thinking about the law's commitment to dignity. I don't deny, and this is the last thing I'll say, I don't deny that this discipline of dignity in various aspects of the law is incomplete. I don't deny that often we sell it short. It's a normative discipline. It is costly and demanding. I think it is momentous that we are committed to it nevertheless. But the commitment sometimes wavers. And as with all commitments, people sometimes don't do what they are committed to do. And you might worry that the account I've been given has painted law in a very nice light and a very flattering light. So consider the United States. It is burdened by a history of slavery and racism, and that has affected the way in which it coerces and the way in which it rules people. 
The 13th Amendment, for example, didn't abolish slavery unconditionally. It abolished slavery except in prisons. And um, critics have often observed that in regard to the dignitarian aspect of its treatment of prisoners, America remains an outlier compared to, say, West European systems which have attempted to generalize formally high status notions of imprisonment or high status notions of incarceration. And in regard to some of the other aspects of the argument I've been making about respectful coercion, we know from miserable reports from Texas and other states that American defendants are sometimes kept silent and passive in courtrooms by the use of belt technology, which enables a judge to subject them to electric shocks if they misbehave by pressing a button on the bench. Mary, I don't think you'd like that in the Court of Appeal. Um, and reports of prisoners being herded with cattle prods uh, occasionally emerge from time to time. Conditions in our prisons, so in the United States, I believe something similar is true in Britain, are de facto terrorizing, well known to be terrorizing, and officials feel free to make use of those terroristic conditions, imposing plea bargains to prisoners uh, in a way that is thoroughly abusive. And as I said, in recent years, we've seen the United States tempted away from dignitarian ideals in drastic regards in the attempt to establish forms of legally unreviewable detention and in its use of torture and other inhuman and degrading forms of treatment against terrorist detainees. What do we say about all of that, which is true? Because other examples could be multiplied from many other countries, including this one. Here's what I say. A legal system is a normative order, both explicitly and implicitly. The laws don't tell us what happens. The laws tell us what is to happen. The laws tell us what ought to happen. Explicitly, the law commits itself to certain norms. The rules and standards that it says publicly that it will uphold and enforce, most of those it actually does uphold and enforce, but occasionally for others in certain regards it fails to do so. The law says the state should pay compensation to Smith, but Smith does not receive it. In those cases, we can be very clear, the law has fallen short of its own publicly enunciated standards, and we hope that doesn't happen too often. It's more difficult when the standards are implicit rather than explicit in the way that I have been talking about, when they embodied implicitly in the practices, institutions, and traditions of a system of governance. And that's what I've been arguing about dignity, that the idea of dignity is implicit in due process, implicit in the mode of coercion, implicit in equality before the law, and so on. But I believe, nevertheless, a very similar logic obtains the commitment to dignity that I think is evinced implicitly in our legal practices and institutions is present there and it is supposed to be controlling even though we sometimes fall short of it. Our practices convey a sort of promise, but they do it implicitly. And just as in moral life you don't always say, I hereby promise to do this, but you give a commitment to your spouse. Uh, that you'll do this in various implicit ways. So the law gives us commitments in various implicit ways. And just as it would be a very naive mistake to think that the only promises that ever existed were promises that were carried out, so similarly it would be a mistake to say that the only implicit commitments that the law has ever given us are the implicit commitments that the law has actually kept faith with. Dignity, in the sense that I've been talking about, is an implicit aspect of a legal system. And as I said, it's a ramshackle work in progress, and it's often, there is often a falling short. Of course, the interesting thing about law's commitment to dignity, and now I circle back to where I began, is that the promise is actually embedded institutionally in both the ways that I've been talking about. Because there is the stuff in section one of this lecture, in section two of this lecture, about the reference to dignity in the explicit texts of certain documents that we have referred ourselves there to. It is there internally or inherently in the tissue of our practices and institutions, but it's also present in rules, standards, and preambles that we have explicitly com committed ourselves to, like the Geneva Conventions or like the, uh, the preamble to the International Covenant. The two sorts of commitments reinforce each other. And this is not unusual in regard to legal ideals. Article 1.9 of the U.S. Constitution prohibits ex post facto laws, but many people would say quite reasonably that this is also a definitive feature of law as such. So what we have here is an abundance of riches 
And just as it would be wrong to infer from the fact that Article 1.9 might have been different in the US Constitution, that therefore law is only contingently, contingently committed to prospectivity. So it would be quite wrong to infer from the fact that the European <coughs> Convention might have been different, that therefore law is only contingently committed to the protection of dignity. It's an inherent, in my view, an essential commitment, and it is worth working with that when we understand how legal systems operate. Thank you very much indeed. had a really good lecture, really interesting lecture, and there may be a few points that people in the audience might want to make or questions to ask. Protest. We've got about five, five minutes to, for, for, for comments or questions, if anybody would like to make those. Professor Kramer. Professor Kramer at the Well, I'd like to ask quite a few questions, but I'll, I'll ask one. Um, no legal positivist would deny that the people of self application standards is distinctive of war in the mode of government. So no legal positivist would deny that that feature is a necessary condition for the treatment of people with dignity. But what a legal positivist like me would deny is that that feature is anything like a sufficient condition and, and that that feature can, in fact, um, be used for the, for the outright denial of dignity. So let me offer an example without um, attempting to gloss over all the disanalogy. But a bank robber um, relies on the capa capacities of the bank clerk as a reflective agent to follow his instructions. If, the bank, yeah. if the bank clerk doesn't open the safe, the robber can't get what he wants. Okay. And so he relies indispensably on the agency of that person and that person's capacity to follow the bank robber's behest. Likewise with the kidnapper, there may be complicated instructions to be followed. And if the, um, if the addressee of those instructions doesn't comply with them, the kidnapper Matt, Matt, you're absolutely right. And so, so this is a uh, distinctive feature of law, by no means uh, a feature of law that distinguishes it from other normative interactions. Families work through self-application. Uh, ordinary economic transactions work through self-application. And so does the bank robber example. So law has that in common with other systems of rule. But the fact that it has it in common, it has it in common for a reason, which is the respect for human dignity, not just the respect for efficacy. And we may want to debate that. But also remember what bank robbers sometimes do. So at a famous bullion robbery in Heathrow, when the, uh, the, the guards would not self-apply the bank robber's norm, they covered him with petrol and held a cigarette lighter very close to him. And although it's tempting to say, oh, okay, so I'll now consider the utility of being burned to death compared to... And, and, and what's going to happen is, in fact, somebody's going to say, I'm going to be burned to death, I'm going to be burned to death, and you go into a shivering situation of terror in which agency is largely short-circuited. And what law and legal systems do, on my account, is that they pledge never to coerce like that. They, they coerce forcefully, but not terroristically. Or at least they do that at their best. Sorry, Thank you. Uh, my question is about the similar action, because I was led to think about Foucault and his claim about self-policing citizens. Uh, I suppose Foucault would say you know, it's a mistake to think that kind of overtly coercive forms of rule are more repressive than the forms of rule that get people to implicate uh, uh, themselves. You know, they actually have a more repressive, more yes. basic, more total power. Yes. Yes. So, so I, I mean, I've, and, and again, it would be interesting to, to talk in detail about that. One thing it might show us is that the insistence on dignified coercion is not the same as the insistence on less repressive coercion, right? So that there might be several dimensions in play here. And it may well be that nothing is more repressive than, say, the inculcation of norms, the internalization of norms. But nevertheless, for all its repressiveness, it is a way of respecting human agency and human presence and the ability to monitor and modulate your own behavior 
compared to other modes of <laughs> coercion which may be less Foucauldian in their character, uh, more brutal in their character, but bypass or short circuit human dignity. It may even mean that, that their dignity needs to be unpacked with a certain sort of uh, Foucauldian genealogy as well, but that would be the further point. So question at the back there. How does your account of legal dignity involving agency, choice, self-presentation apply to those who are unable to perform those functions due to infancy or through disability? Indeed, and, and disability can range from just simply not having forensic skills of an advocate to, to radical disability. So again, this is something that we have constructed, something that we build, and one of the devices or practices that we build is the device of representation. And when people make claims about the importance of representation, this is part that I necessarily omitted because of time, but one of the ideas is we want to work with two propositions. The first is, as a matter of dignity, everybody's point of view has to be heard and listened to. Everybody's arguments have to be paid attention to. As a second point, since people are radically unequal in their ability to present arguments, for precisely the reasons that you mentioned, we have developed notions of representation. And of course, representation varies from person to person. But when we insist, for example, that even the lowliest and most impoverished criminal is entitled to a public defender, and when we insist that uh, infants in some contestation uh, need guardians ad litem and so on, we are insisting on developing modes of conveying indirectly the dignified presence of those people in the proceedings. So I think representation is one of the constructive aspects which we are building on this vast building site of laws commitment to dignity. Very important. One last question. Sorry, sir. Mm -hmm. Professor Walden, <coughs> I was wondering whether you might have given the same, if you allow me to say so, fully excellent lecture, but with the term autonomy substituted for dignity throughout. Yes, it's perfectly possible, and um, a number of people skeptical about the language of dignity have asked and asked again, what work does this do that the notion of autonomy doesn't mm. do? Normally, I mean, and, and in the older notion of autonomy, the notion of being a law to oneself, being able to, as it were, um, behave in a law-like manner, not just behave with a degree of negative freedom. That older notion of autonomy might be relatively easy to substitute in. I'm not sure that it would convey exactly the same idea of presence, presence that must be taken seriously, or convey exactly the same idea of paying attention to a person's view of a matter, or paying attention to an argument. So uh, I, I acknowledge immediately, it's a, it's, it's a perfectly good point that the two ideas are very close together. But the idea of dignity as a status that must be paid attention to, not just made room for, I think is, is an important one. Well, we'll have to finish there. Um, I'm sure there were plenty of questions that people will want to ask. We've had the privilege of a very clear, a very committed presentation of an idea of dignity that can work in law and that can set an ideal for law. And it's an idea deal which treats individuals in society as some people who are capable of doing things on their own and being supported by law and sometimes confronted by law. What we've had is something which we can take forward into a range of different activities of our own or research and work of our own, whether as judges, as, as students, as academics, and in different disciplines. For that, we're very grateful, and it is a very fitting tribute to the work that Sir David Williams committed his life to in ensuring both high standards of scholarship and great commitment to civil liberties. Can we thank Jeremy Waldron and Neil for Thank you very much. Thank you very much.